You're watching Deprogrammed. This is the New Culture Forum's latest show, committed to fighting back against the forces of ideological conformity, particularly among the young. My name's Harrison Pitt, I'm a senior editor at the European Conservative, and I'm thrilled to be joined today, as ever, by Evan Riggs, who is a freelance journalist, and our special guest this week, Paul Morland, a distinguished authority on demographics and author, most recently, of Tomorrow's People. Now, Paul, um, one of the main theses in your book, um, t t uh, tomorrow, Tomorrow's People, is the idea that like, demographics fundamentally shapes power, um, power dynamics be between countries. Would, would it be fair to say that one of the lessons we've learned over the last four weeks, that it also shapes power dynamics within countries that have embraced mass immigration and multiculturalism? Certainly does. And in fact, that was the theme of my first book, which was my PhD thesis. Uh, which is demographic engineering, where I look at ethnic conflicts. Specifically, I looked at Israel and Palestine. I looked at Sri Lanka, Northern Ireland, and in fact, the United States. And in all of those cases, I looked at how groups in ethnic conflict, and those ethnic conflicts are very diff different. Some are violent, uh, some are not, some have been, some haven't been. But essentially, where you have groups of different ethnic ethnicity within a single country, how they actually deploy demography as part of their strategy in the conflict. So just to give you a few examples, we don't think of the United States as a country particularly of ethnic conflict, although perhaps more now than we did when I wrote the thesis. But if you look at issues such as US immigration policies in the 20s, they were very much driven by a view of what the United States should be demographically. If you look at how the United States expanded, 1848, war against Mexico, took this vast part of Mexico and actually conquered the whole country. And the debate in Congress concluded, we don't want the southern half of the country, it's full of Mexicans, we definitely don't want them. The northern half of the country will take, it's got hardly anyone in them. And then, when they, when they actually made these administered territories states, they only did it once they had an Anglo majority. Mm. So the last one was New Mexico, mm. early 20th century, quite a long time after. Only once they had the technology to bring in the irrigation, which brought in the European origin farmers, did they actually make that a, a state which could then govern itself. So would the United States wish to have annexed Cuba or Philippines? All these things were debated. And actually, it was an ethnic decision around who were Americans, who were in and mm. who wasn't. Mm. And that's something which has evolved over time. If you look at the conflict in Sri Lanka, how Sinhalese and Tamils were defined, um, m migrations of uh, hill plantation Tamils to southern India, forced migrations. The, the whole history can be best understood as an ethnic struggle with a demographic fundamental uh, substructure. Hmm. I mean, the, the cruel irony being that everybody in America now expects that area that was once Mexico to basically return to it in probably the next, you know, I don't know, five or six decades, it will essentially become re-annexed by its, uh, its original host. Well, I would wonder if that was the case, because of course there's what I call hard demography and soft demography. The hard demography is actually moving people around. The soft demography is drawing borders on maps, but it's also about how people integrate. And I think there's a lot of evidence that the Latino population in the United States is assimilating fairly quickly, that the Spanish language is lost fairly rapidly. Uh, Catholicism, which doesn't really mark them out as anything other than as American as JFK, mm. even that is falling away. So I do think that there are some populations, migrant populations, which can and will assimilate fairly rapidly. But one thing, one thing I would say is that we don't want to focus too much on the United States. I think it's most important for our audience to focus on what's happening in Britain uh, here. But there's, I mean, I mean, what evidence is there, for example, that Latinos at scale don't consider themselves Latinos first and Americans second to some extent. I mean, to, to what extent are they committed given what they regard as their tribal group? And, you know, uh, c tribal collectivism is an important feature of human psychology. That's part of the thesis of that's why that's why these co conflicts can be, can mm. become incredibly volatile. What evidence is there that Latinos at scale are shedding the importance of their Latino identity and are thinking of American politics primarily, f primarily through the lens of well, this is America's national interest, and so I'm going to set aside my own in-group so ethnic self-interest. What evidence is there that that attitude is, is um, active at scale? I think the evidence is not necessarily that individuals are changing their minds, although they might be, but the evidence is intermarriage. So the number of people of Latino origin who are mm. marrying non-Latino origin individuals. Uh, the falling away of language, which is important, I think, for that identity. If you're two or three generations down the track mm. and you've got one Latino grandparent and you don't speak Spanish, I would question the extent to which you identify 
as a Latino, I think of, of, of re prominent Republican uh, politicians like Marco Rubio and, yes. and, and Cruz. Oh, I can't remember. Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz, yes. I nearly said Tom Cruise. Um, <laughs> but, but I think of people like that. Yes. I think, you know, and the, the example in Britain would be, I, I often say this, people sort of uh, forget when I was a kid, we had a lot of problems with the IRA. We had bombs going off. At the height of this, we had a prime minister called Callaghan mm. and a chance of the exchequer called Healy. <laughs> and if you'd said to anyone, can we trust these people? But they yeah. would have thought you were mad. No, and if you'd it's... spoken to Jim Callaghan or Dennis yeah. Healy and asked them whether, because they had Catholic Irish names, they yes. were, I mean, they, they'd have thought you were, that you were stupid. I, I, and, and I, that, so it can happen. Completely. And, and the evidence in the United States, I think, which I'm not an expert on, but I okay. think it probably is happening in the United well, States. Well, the, the only thing that, I, and maybe this is, sl maybe this is slightly, slightly uh, skewed, uh, this is a slightly skewed data point since politicians tend to be the most attention seeking volatile people but one thing I, d I notice very strongly is that there is a tendency and it, it, it's not not only is there a tendency but it's considered socially status conferring and high st it's, it's considered yeah it's considered status conferring for Latino politicians to say things like we want 20% representation in Congress we want 20% representation in this everything is viewed as far as I can tell, by, particularly by Democrat Latino politicians through the lens of their Latino identity, which is inevitably going to grate with the identity of the host population. So even if they're shedding language, even if they're shedding Catholicism, and as a Catholic myself, I wouldn't even necessarily regard that as a good thing. But it, it, if, if that is happening, okay, that's one thing. But are, are they, are they to, Amer to contemporary America today what, say, Irish Americans and German Americans are today, i.e. people who, I know lots of German Americans, I know lots of Irish Americans, they would never in a million years be inclined, but sh just because their ancestors came there in the 1840s or in the 1850s, to see every single issue in the United States through the non-negotiable lens of their German identity or the Irish identity. That doesn't matter to them. It's a curiosity to them. They look at old pictures of people who immigrated. Maybe. Maybe they do that. But they, it, it doesn't inform their politics in the way that it clearly does for huge swathes of Latinos in the United States. And I think to the extent that that makes um, democratic consensus-based politics more difficult, it's a serious problem and a sign that assimilation isn't actually going it may well, well. It may well be, but three, three points on that. Mm -hmm. um, the first is that it's worth noting that the fertility rate of Latinos, among many other things, mm -hmm. has conformed to the national average. It was much, much higher. Mm. The second thing is that inflows, at least from Mexico, mm. have slowed down significantly. And the third thing is that uh, Latinos voting Republican, whatever uh, the more woke members of the Democratic Party of Latino origin may say or not say or do or not do, uh, has certainly grown. So along all those lines, I think if I were an American, I would not be too worried about uh, Latinos becoming a separate nation within a nation. I think they are a highly mm. assimilable group. Okay. Mm. On, on this topic of, of, of TFR conformity, uh, it seems that most groups in the world, um, within a generation of immigrating to a new place, their, their total fertility rate um, tends to basically average out at the, mm. the host nation's level. But there are some groups that do not do this. Um, I think Muslim, basically, any immigration from anywhere in the world, so long as you're part of the Muslim faith, into, into England would probably be the most stark example here. Do you think there is something, um, two questions on this, do you think there is something inherently pronatal about Islam and kind of not only inherently pronatal but anti anti conformist in that way about about the faith mm. and can you think of any other groups that have that same kind of resilience to that TFR conformity apart from the adherence of Islam so first of all on Islam it is not true that Muslims don't conform they just conform more slowly. Hmm. So the best data that I've seen on the UK, and it's not great, we don't actually have very good TFR by ethnic group or by religion, um, but the best data that I've seen suggests that Sikh and Hindu fertility rates are, if anything, slightly below those for the population as a whole, hmm. and that Muslim rates have come down significantly, um, albeit that they are still relatively high, but they're probably no more than a child above the level of the population as a whole. Now, a child is a lot, it's a whole child, yeah. but it's definitely conforming. Um, in terms of Islam, there's some specifics around the particular Muslim communities that have come to Britain. So in the United States, Muslims are very often more middle class. In Britain, for historic reasons, um, migrants from poor parts of Bangladesh, Silhet, or from poor parts of Kashmir have been the 
predominant South Asian anyway, immigrants or Somalis. So they tended to come from pretty poor backgrounds compared to many other immigrants. And we might expect that to be a cause of their uh, assimilating more slowly. If you actually look globally at Islam, it's true that in most countries where you have a Muslim and a non-Muslim population, the Muslim fertility rate's higher. In India, for example, it's higher, but it is falling significantly. Uh, in Israel, it was higher. It's now about the national average of about three. Uh, so I didn't think there's anything inherent about Muslims. You're talking about Arab Israelis. Arab though. Israelis, yeah. not, mm. and indeed on the West Bank. And even in Gaza, where yeah. it was kind of five or six at the start of the century, the mm. last data is only somewhere between three and three and a mm. half. So even in the occupied territories, the fertility rate has come down significantly. And we do have Muslim countries, such as Lebanon, such as Iran, where fertility rates have fallen, such as Libya. Um, such as Morocco. And what's mm. interesting is many of these countries have not developed very rapidly economically. Mm. They haven't really gone through an economic development, but they've gone through a demographic transition mm. faster than you would have expected given where they are. So, I, uh, however, I do think that all the Abrahamic religions are inherently more pronatal than not, and therefore. It takes longer for all the, the people who adhere to those religions to have a low fertility rate. So we know, famously, Italy now has a very low fertility rate. Catholic Southern Europe, very low fertility rate. It, it moved fairly slowly. If you compare in Asia, say, the fertility rate of predominantly Catholic, the Philippines, mm. or predominantly Muslim, Indonesia, what we find is that those countries have fallen to the kind of two to three level and mm. stuck there. I think the Philippines is still at the higher end and Indonesia at the lower end. Um, countries like Thailand, where they don't have an Abrahamic tradition, they have a Buddhist tradition, there doesn't seem to be much blocking mm. the fall of fertility. We're seeing it in mm. India, predominantly Hindu India as well, that once the, a, a certain level of development kicks in, and it's actually quite a low level of development, uh, you, you start to see very low fertility rates. Large parts of India, West Bengal, Kerala have lower fertility rates than Britain. One of the interesting points that you do make, I think you'd make it in tomorrow's people, is the fact that once we, once so to speak, a, a certain peak of economic and material development has been achieved, because everyone's so to speak on the same playing field at that point, let's, let's, particularly if you live in a multicultural country like Britain, you have the Muslim community, you have the the, 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 the host population, you have the, the Sikh community or the Hindu community, all this sort of thing. Um, what, once the same material conditions obtain, the, what you really begin to see in differentials is the result of what people fundamentally think in terms of values and, and religions and all the rest of it. And I think in answer to Evan's question, would, would it be fair to say as well that there are also certain c Christian communities who have held out and re remained inc incredibly pronatalist, haven't shed that part of their religious inheritance? To the, and I'm using Christian in a broad sense here to include Quakers, to include um, uh, Mormons in particular in the, in the United States. I mean, I, I, I haven't met many Mormons, but every Mormon I have met is from a family of about 12 people. Well, you're right um, about Christian groups, but um, I don't think the Quakers have a particularly high fertility rate. The Mormons mm. have, have a rate that has fallen. What do I mean? I mean the Amish. Yeah, I, I mean, the Amish have taken over Pennsylvania. The Mormons have fallen <laughs> very the Amish. Good. The Amish and the Hutterites have very, very high fertility. Mm. fertility. They're still very small groups. So the question with them is, are they able to do two things? Number one, mm. retain a high fertility rate. Number two, retain a low attrition rate, by mm. which I mean few people of their children and their grandchildren falling off the path, as mm. it were. Mm. Um, the Hasidic Jews, or Haredi Jews more generally, are a good example of this. A, a, if, if you can maintain a fertility rate of average six or seven, for a number of generations, and very few of those leave the fold, then you will have astronomical growth. You could have growth of three or four percent mm. a year, which, which, as you can imagine, if you project that forward for a couple of hundred years, the question is, can you maintain it for a couple of hundred years? Uh, we we often delude ourselves that certain groups are inherently perinatalist. So, in my second book, The Human Tide, I talk about how. The French, after 1870, looked over the Rhine and thought, oh my goodness, the German woman will always have more children. Mm. And uh, then the Germans, whose fertility rate, like ours, had fallen to about three by the time of the First World War, looked east and saw the Russians and said, oh, the endlessly fertile Russian woman. And now we know that Germany and Russia have very low fertility rates. Yes. So I wouldn't necessarily think that these groups will retain their fertility rates so high for so long, or that they'll be able to retain all their people. But if they do, then they will become very significant um, demographically in due course. There, there are contingent factors involved as well, to be for sure. It's not just universal essences 
of certain faiths or certain ways of thinking which drive this. That, mu that must be true. Um, but if we, if we, if we, if we um, continue on Britain for a bit, one question that I'm, I'm genuinely curious to hear the answer to is that I, I think rather uncontroversially you, uh, earlier on in this, you, you went through all sorts of parts of the, all sorts of places in the world, all sorts of stri foreign stretches of the map where ethnicity, like a perception of ethnic in-group and ethnic out-groups clearly informs politics and it even can, can spark wars. Why is there a reluctance to acknowledge in Europe that the more we imitate that kind of those kind of heterogeneous dynamics by embracing diversity and trying to sell it as some kind of strength what if the, if the significance of demographics is readily acknowledged by our political class as it will do in places like tibet places like israel why is it not acknowledged here why is there such a strong taboo on that well i'm sometimes asked why i'm interested in this subject and one of the reasons i give is that i was born and brought up in wembley and uh, few parts of london have seen such early and thoroughgoing mm. ethnic changes Wembley and I remember when I started studying that notorious subject philosophy politics and economics in the early 80s my tutor said to me now Brent that Brent which is the borough mm. which Wembley sits it's a very interesting place it's the only part of London and possibly the UK that has real New York style politics mm. in those days there was a kind of Jewish caucus there was an Asian caucus. It, it's changed a lot since then and that is the way the country could potentially go now with constituency systems in Britain we haven't seen the rise of a an ethnic party uh, certainly within England I mean Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland are different and, and regional we are now seeing with the war in Gaza the rise of a dissent within Labour exactly. for example yes. and and I think Keir Starmer and politics uh, contemporary British politics not particularly my area of expertise but obviously I follow it and Keir Starmer clearly wants to differentiate himself from Jeremy Corbyn who no doubt won the allegiance not only a lot of a lot of hard left wingers but a lot of Palestinian sympathetic Muslims and what he found was that for every one of those people that you attract quietly you annoy an awful lot of people a lot of decent labor voters felt nauseated by seeing jeremy corbyn laying a wreath at the or at least present uh, if not participating mm. at the at, at, at the <laughs> tomb says, yes. of, a, of someone who had massacred israeli um olympians uh, i think a, a, athletes That's in a, in munich um all praising or defending a mural whose own uh, artist said it was depicting jewish bankers and a few non-Jewish bankers feasting off the backs mm -hmm. of uh, the, the toiling masses and so yes. on. So I think a lot of people found that disgusting. Now the trouble is uh, when a certain ethnic group reaches a certain level, then there is a potential for that kind of ethnic politics. Our system in Britain, because of constituency systems, makes that difficult. We kind of saw it with George Galloway when he was, that, he yes. was flirting with the Trotskyists and a Muslim group. Now he's interestingly mm. flirting with us with the Stalinists but that's mm. his uh, his lookout but trying to build sort of green red uh, alliances uh, hasn't really worked yet I think because of the constituency system it won't in Britain but we could probably more likely to see it in other countries where the political system is different mm. and politics changes it was class-based it could become ethnic based yes. I find that alarming but other people might just say, well, that's political development. And I remember the 70s when we had a very much class based politics and it was alarming seeing very violent yeah, pickets but the, but outside yeah. factories. Indeed. But the, but the fact that and I know you're not saying you agree with this, but the, the, the fact that there exists already in any population, there are going to be d divides of, so, to do with socioeconomic, just, that's, just, that's in the nature of human relations that you're going to have economic divisions. You're going to presumably to have regional divisions. I mean, division, like, politics exists in order to try and converge peacefully on solutions to solve the divisions but that's no reason to invite potentially dozens of intractable div divisions into your country and it's very interesting I saw Aaron Bastani the other day um, trying to explain why is it and he actually it's, it's so it's so it's astonishingly ignorant in so many ways saying well, I wonder why it is that the Labour Party today is, is so racked over of the issue of um, Israel Palestine in the 1970s Harold Wilson was a was a very mild-mannered liberal Labour Zionist. I mean, w I mean, clearly something changed. He, th those are his words, and then he tr he tries to explain it by recourse to the influence of the Socialist Workers Party, as though uh, it, it, I mean, without demographic change since the nineties, it's very possible that in the last four weeks we would have had some protests in the street, but they would have been 
new left cranks from the 1960s all boomers presumably yeah, there, and, would, and there wouldn't have been 100,000 there wouldn't have been 100,000 of them so Aaron Vastani's sort of fake puzzlement over how, how on earth did we get here this is a problem that we didn't need to invite upon us and I think that's why people feel so disgusted by the scenes we've seen I don't even think it has I mean obviously we, we, the, the manifestations of anti-semitism as well the, 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 the obvious horrors of you know um, you know, uh, sort of uh, glorifying terrorism or, or having a parachute on your back or you know, ripping down a, a, a poster of a kidnapped child. Obviously, all that is, th those are the most um, viral things. Those are the things that go viral. But I think the, 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 the more deep seated objection that the British people have to this is a sense that this, it didn't, we, we, we didn't need to import these sorts of ethno religious grievances into our midst. And it, it, it illustrates the failure. Of, of, of multiculturalism in that way. So it's not even about being anti-free speech and, and thinking that, you know, having a moral panic over these things. It, it, it reflects something that has happened to the British people without their consent. And I think that's what grates um, pe against people's sentiments so strongly. Well, I did watch that Aaron Bastani interview. I was did quite you? astonished that he didn't know the founder of the SWP was someone called Yigal Gluckstein, <laughs> who changed his name to Tony Cliff. And uh, <laughs> having been born in British yeah. Mandate yeah. Palestine, yes. became a very strong supporter of uh, all things anti-Zionist. Yes. Um, the fact is that, and I think no doubt we will move on to this in due course, mm that in this country we have not had enough children for the last 50 years. Now there are, and this is where I come on to my concept of the trilemma, there are really three things we can do. We can go the Japanese route saying no immigrants, thank you very much, uh, we'll shut the doors, there is a differential fertility rate, it mm -hmm. will dissipate, and this country will remain majority if not predominantly uh, indigenous white British as a term I, I use unashamedly because it's on the census right? Indeed, and yes. it's a self-identification term. That would be the Japanese option but we will have terrible labour shortages um, and if you go into an old age home today or you're looking at who the bus drivers are, so many professions, so many jobs are being done by immigrants because we weren't having enough children can, ourselves. Can I, sorry yeah. I don't mean to interrupt the trilemma here but I hear this a lot when people talk about um, fertility rates and like looking ahead. Could you flesh out just like very specifically what would actual like t terrible labor shortages mean? Because I mean, there's going to be pros and cons to any part, any sort of attempted solution. Of course. What does that actually look like in practicality? Well, I had this discussion with a, ta a former Thatcherite cabinet minister, one of the few who's still around. And he said, oh, nonsense, nonsense. So the market sort thing out. You don't just bring in any, like any resource. If it's, if it's short, it's expensive. The price goes up, demand goes down. What are we fussing about? Now, I'm not unsympathetic to that point of view, but it forgets the fact that we don't live in the kind of free market economy where we say, well, you know, if you can't, if we haven't got enough surgeons, we'll just price accordingly. And mm. if you can't afford or not, too bad. Mm. If you are an old person living alone and you can't look after yourself and you can't go into the labour market and find someone to do your work for you because you haven't got enough money, that's too bad. So I'm not, I, mm. I am emotionally a Thatcherite. I think that period was incredibly important for this country, but we are now confronted with the fact that we have a large state and we expect as a society the state to do an mm. awful lot for people and mm. we do not say let the devil take the hindmost and we don't say sorry you will have to sit at home and look after yourself dear old person we don't say if you can't afford an op for your kid or you can't afford a teacher for your so we we don't live in this um free market utopia mm. that some people uh who were at the the peak of their careers in the 1980s might like us to do in fact as we age another article i'm going to work on i hope as we age, we become more dependent on the state. So mm. it's hard, I, I, the, the title for that, that essay, if I ever get around to writing it, will be small families or small state. You mm. can't have both. Yes. I think it's, it's very difficult to have both. So there's a shortage of labor we see in everything from, for example, do you remember that crisis a couple of years ago? We had no fuel drivers and the, yes. the petrol stations. Ran. I wasn't here at the time, but I had heard about it, yeah. So we threw money at that and it's, it's a bit whack-a-mole. If you're short of labor, those labor shortages mm. will show up. Business leaders are crying out for labor. Now, of course, we could say, well, 
price labor up, more restaurants will shut. If people can't pay the price, that the, the you know fewer people in the in the market, more yeah. expensive waiters and, and chefs, more expensive food in the restaurants to eat in a restaurant, fewer people. There are certain parts of the economy where that market mechanism can work, but there are a lot of parts of it where it doesn't work. And if you get a general shortage of labor. It is inflationary, um, that's one thing. Mm. But more to the point, we won't live in a world where people get priced out. Mm. And we insist on the state making provision. And if there are a few and yeah, few... There'll be democratic pressures which will naturally enormous, express themselves. Enormous, yes. 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 Um, Does that answer your question? Yeah, more or less. I don't know. I always, um, I kind of think that there will be a, a sort of cultural shift if this was to happen instead of people would bring their loved ones back into their home rather than being like, well, now you have to die on your own because we can't find a, a helper to work for you. Or people will just, you know, cook at home or have big kind of family neighborhood do meals. Own, do their own brain surgery. <laughs> Maybe not brain surgery, but I mean, I think for uh, many of the examples that you pointed out, I do think that the culture would shift to kind of fill in the gap. Yes. And it would become a little bit more communal. It, it might also be worth making a distinction between well, certainly worth making a distinction between high skilled labor and low skilled labor. I mean, like you know, needing someone, I'm, I'm the people who do social care are incredibly self sacrificed and all the rest of it, but it, it's less hard than brain surgery, as I understand it. More um, people can do it. More people can do it. Not everyone can do it. Not everyone can do it, but more people can do it. Let's put it that way. Let's, <coughs> let's, let's, let's put it that way. So many of the things which could be potentially nipped in the bud by what, uh, what Evan's talking about, a sort of sh a shift in the cultural zeitgeist about how we're going to live and how we're going to relate to one another. And it's very interesting that, by the, that you mention. Uh, small states and small families, this is a thought that I've had re recently, especially if the only re relationship that exists in society is, the re is, that, is that which exists between the individual and the state, then inevitably the estate is going to arrogate more and more responsibilities unto itself because everything in between, families most of all, have been parish, you know, guild, all these sorts of things have been completely hollowed out. What we may, what, what I would want to see, and what Evan's talking about, is a, is a sort of a renaissance of those in-betweens, of those, those arts of association that people like Tocqueville talk about, about, and Tocqueville regarded those things as important precisely because they preclude the need for some kind of gigantic leviathan that is going to do everything and all that, all that sort of thing. But at, at, the high, at, the, at the high end of the labour market, where you really do need, why is it not possible just to import I don't know, 10,000 Indian surgeons and leave it at that. Why does it need to be, do you know what I mean? Well, it's not just surgeons, it's everything. I would say much of our labor market. But I think the advantage we have is that although we're starting from slightly different places, I too would like to see a, a stronger society mm -hmm. and less dependence on the state. But we do live in a world where if Mr. Bloggs had no children or Mrs. Bloggs and lives on his or her yes. own, we will move in. The state does feel it needs mm -hmm. to move in. I think a world in which we have larger families mm. is not only a world in which we are going to resolve that labor shortage ourselves mm. over a course of time while those children enter the labor market, mm. but also a world in which there are fewer people who don't have children. Mm. So there are more children to look after their parents, mm -hmm. and there are all sorts of positive things. If you get larger families, the advantages of siblinghood, the advantages of stable families, larger families they not only fill up the workforce eventually and solve that problem, but they mean that more and more people can look to their families and not to the state. Mm. So although we're starting from different places, I think you too can see a solution in more people settling down, having their children earlier, mm. having a, a slightly larger family. But what, what I'm questioning is... The, the, well, I think too, I mean, that'd yeah. be a great way to boost the TFR up. It's like, if you yes. don't have kids, you'll die alone. Yes, uh, yes. I mean, that was a big thing when yeah. I decided yeah. that I, I eventually did want to have kids is when I realized well, maybe they're going to be taken care of my kids or by somebody else's. Yes. And I mean, if, I don't know if people have ever looked at the uh, abuse rates in nursing homes, but I would much rather prefer they were mine. Yes, no. Probably be a little bit nicer to me. Uh, absolutely. And one of the things that I think very strongly, I actually went to a conference on fertility in Poland recently, and it's very interesting. I don't, I don't know a huge amount about the subject. I'm an amateur, I'm an amateur enthusiast, as you probably noticed. Uh, but um, I was very, it, one thought that I did come away with is that, gosh, fertility... It ha has such an, a, a, a mega effect on everything else that matters to us. And we have mentioned two in the course of this conversation. We've mentioned the, the fact that people are increasingly fearful of the rise of the, the, the Leviathan, the, the, the rise of the state, the mm. enlargement of the state. People feel as though that's crowding out individuality and private life and all that sort of thing. And people also are very against the, the rates of immigration we've seen over the last 20 years. If we could successfully, as conservatives, broadly speaking, small c conservatives, if we could tie the issue of fertility to those, those issues which already enjoy extreme salience in the public mind, 
that would be wonderful. I think it? it would really help, but I think yeah. there is a problem of compassion, mm. which is that if we are going to say, have children or you'll be on your own when you're old, we have then to face off to people who are on their own and say too bad. And there are all sorts of reasons people can't have children. Equally, when we have people landing on our beaches, how compassionate or not compassionate are we? Now, I think that there is a problem in that we, I don't think we have the hearts to be uncompassionate. I don't think we have the hearts to turn people back to drown. And I don't, which is why I think alternatives mm. like showing them that they will end up in not particularly salubrious conditions in Africa may be a solution. But I think we, we are a compassionate society. Yes. Where you draw the line on that compassion, how far that compassion goes, the extent to which that compassion undermines our ability to act in our own interest, yes. all of those things are really important. But wherever you are on that spectrum, if you have more children, families are larger, parents have got more children to rely on, children have got siblings to help out, the family is more is larger and more self-reliant. Wherever you are on that spectrum, you can afford to be a more compassionate society without it undermining you in the sense that you actually need the immigration and that you actually need to provide the, mm. the state as a filler because the families simply aren't there. My worry is that compassion, and I agree that compassion is very good, but that it, it, it has a, uh, a, a dwindling fuse. I think you've pointed out that at current trends, um, Britain will become white ethnic uh, minority state in 2060 or 27. Well, that's re I, I, uh, it's all very, it hugely depends on the level of immigration. Yeah. Okay. But it, by, by 26 or 2070, that's David Coleman's work. Sure. Yes. That oh, would, on current trends. Whatever, whatever decade trends, it may yes. end up being, and maybe probably it's sooner, 2100. Given, given the current levels of immigration, probably yeah. sooner. But if that happens, and I, I can't think of a single historical example where a country has had a demographic shift, not like just through like straight warfare or invasion, but mm. basically a trickle of coming into a flood in, um, I think that compassion immediately goes away. If you basically told white British people, you're now at 49%, that compassion dissipates overnight. And I think what will then replace that will be like seething resentment, which is something I would very much like to avoid, mm. um, which is why I, I really like you're going back to the trilemma, mm. you have these kind of three approaches to it, which would be Japan, which would kind of automate yourself yes. out of it and just accept uh, slowing down. The second one is importation, essentially, which is what we're doing here. Yes. Can you remind me what the third the one third is? The third is Israel, where the fertility rate is three children per woman, so just which make is everybody more, than a whole, more than a whole child more than any other OECD hmm. country. And even the Israelis who are secular have an all, very close yeah. to replacement. Which is level. very interesting. It goes to show how, it, like, if, if, if <coughs> the dominant culture in any given geographical space is itself relig is, is religious, it, it can have a sort of trickle-on domino effect, even among people who aren't, because you imitate your environment, and so, you, you, well, I might be a, a very secular, um, s I don't know, secular Jew living in Tel Aviv, but my neighbour is an Orthodox Jew, and therefore I, I see he has seven kids, so I may as well have two. I think in the case of Israel, and again, this is something that I covered in my first book on ethnic conflict and mm. uh, demography. The case of Israel is the case of a country which has been under threat from the moment it was born, mm -hmm. whose people know what it's like to be the object of genocide, and who uh, whose neighbours have been pretty unapologetic, whether yes. whether the West wants to hear it or mm. not. That w what their intentions are, and we've all been reminded of that, that, that Palestine free from the river to the sea means Jew free, and mm. those that can get out, good luck to them, and those that can't. We yes. know what. So with that in, in, in mind, you might in terror wish to leave, or you might in terror not wish to have children, mm. or you might encourage, say, this is our stand, here we are, um, and you know we're going to make a go of this, and that involves having large families, because secular Jews in New York have among the smallest family sizes mm -hmm. in the United States. Yeah. So yeah. it's not, I don't think it's so much about the fact that there are religious people it's around. It's a national ethos it's about, and it's built mm -hmm. on the national history. So it's about, it's a, it's a, maybe what we need to do then is we, we, we need to revive the idea as conservatives that everything that we value exists on a knife, on a knife edge. It's all perishable. Um, think ephemerality is, is, is at, the, at the heart of the human condition. We, we can't just keep, uh, in, in a very, I think I think this is one of the main problems with liberalism is that is that, and I mean of the classical variety, liberalism liberalism likes to think that it's 
its 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 ideas, its its principles are so inherently yeah, wonderful appealing, yeah. and appealing <laughs> and universal that they can sustain themselves in midair. Whereas, in fact, in so many cases, and Britain would be an excellent example, liberalism sits atop like centuries worth of scaffolding <laughs> and social capital, and I would argue demographic homogeneity as well, a, sh a shared sense of morality, a shared ethic, all of these things make the best aspects of liberalism possible. And the more, that w and, and w I think the Israelis understand that. The, the Israelis understand that to the extent that Israel is a liberal society, they understand that that liberalism doesn't just sustain itself. You need to be vigilant at the border. You need to have a, um, you, you, you need to be conscious of the fact that you, that you are always living in history, you're not living at the end of history or after history, so to speak. Whereas I think we've lost that sense in in Europe, and we need to revive it quickly because there's nothing about being white British or white French or white German which makes you magically immune from being persecuted if you become a minority in your own homeland. There's nothing. I mean, ask the South Africans. Ask. I mean, yeah. There, well, there is as part of this mm. sort of national not, idea. Not, yeah, I should say not that South Africa is the homeland of. Of the, of, of the Africans, and I'm not trying to say that, but you, you get the point. That, yes, that and there is uh, my old friend, uh, the um, theorist of nationalism, Anthony Smith, the late Ant Anthony mm. D. Smith, um, used to talk about the, the myth of common ancestry. Mm. It wasn't necessarily the case. Genetics tells us an awful lot now, which it couldn't tell us when Anthony started yes. writing. But the idea that we, when I'm, I, my parents are immigrants to this country, I feel 100% affiliation to this country, there's always space for those who acculturate mm. and assimilate mm. um, and in a liberal country like ours are able to keep their own traditions their own religions mm -hmm. and so on but I think your point about how precarious things are mm. because we've lived in a country where there's been no real invasion for a thousand years and where there's this wonderful myth the second world war our darkest hour and then we rallied and wasn't it glorious I think people assume that uh, all things are going to be bright and beautiful mm. and all people are pretty fungible mm. it doesn't really matter where they come from their culture will assimilate yes. and acculturate regardless of the numbers and I think that is a risky strategy and I think the civilized decent life that we live in this country is under far more threat and the whole of Western Europe under far more threat from a whole range of directions than we realize um, that that the sense of precariousness, whether that would actually mm. result in a rise in the fertility rate in Britain, I don't know. Yes. But I do think that our, our decent and civilized life is precarious. One of the things that makes it so precarious, I believe, and this is rather straying away from demography, mm. but nevertheless the case, is that if you come to believe that your civilized and extraordinarily decent country is actually an uncivilized and indecent country, you're losing protective layers. Effectively, mm. the protective layers are being stripped away from you. If you don't see, no, no doubt we're not a flawless state, but if you don't see the fundamental decency in your way of life, mm. uh, particularly compared to so many other parts of the world, if you don't compare yourself to reality, not to some theoretical woke construct, but to the other options available in history and geography, then I think you are losing a, a sort of self-protective layer. Yes. Mm. Uh, but this is a rather a long way from my uh, well, I think from it's, my I, topic. I, I, well, I don't think it is at all. I think it's very closely related to it because one of the things that demography reminds people is that we 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 are not just working with theoretical constructs. I mean, like the the, the rational aspect of human nature matters, but it needs to work with raw material. It doesn't it doesn't so to speak exist in some platonic realm of pure mathematics where you can just oh wouldn't it be lovely if that where that was like that, <coughs> and this was like you need to work with demographics. You need to work with geography, and th 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 there's that sort of understanding of the need to pay attention to the concrete, which informs your discipline very strongly. Well, and I mean, one of the best ways to keep a a decent country going and a decent community and mm. society going is for those who belong to it and who are decent and yes. civilized yeah. to have children and to inculcate them in those values. Okay. And if they don't have them, or if they have them and they don't inculcate them in those values, then we have a problem. So, yeah, I mean, liberalism only exists if liberals are continuing to be born. If you yes. could somehow kind of like finger snap all the liberals off the planet, you know, like uh, Thanos style. Yeah. Yes. It's not, I would say, it's not uh, inherently obvious to me that I give it another 20, 30 years, it would be resurrected en masse. I'm sure some mm. people would dust off John Stuart Miller, I'm like, oh, this guy was onto some stuff. But the idea that it would then come back in a, in, into the form that it is now, mm. it's not the case. I mean, you could even, uh, it's a, <coughs> maybe a bit of a strange analogy, but you could even look at, you know, the Second World War and, you know, the, the plight of Jews and that 
what, 80 years later, they mm -hmm. still haven't gotten back up to the same level of population that they were before, yes. um, you know, Hitler decided to have a bit of a persecutorial moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's, it's been almost an entire century. So it's if I could there. give another analogy, in the 18th century, cities were not very clean or nice places no, to live. they weren't. And people came from the countryside and they were demographic sinks, really. Hmm. People had relatively few children and sorry, they died. What, sorry, sorry, the, cities the cities were, were sinks. sinks. Were cities but were London, Paris survived because there was a constant inflow of, uh, of rural people into right. the urban areas. Mm. That was how cities kept going. And in a sense, I feel liberals, particularly in the United States, which has different geography, are rather like the cities of old. Hmm. They don't produce themselves. We know there's a correlation between liberal values or liberalism or wokeism, however we define and low it, fertility. and low fertility. Yeah. And they can only survive by the relative high fertility of other groups, which they then absorb. Their, so offspring don't necessarily follow the political example of their children. Yes. And so I think it, the, 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 the woke liberal element which is very often antenatal and which in practical terms doesn't have very large families, mm. is actually reliant for its continued existence on the fertility of others to provide its services mm. and also for its own existence as a sort of ideological core to attract those people. Mm. And that's not a very healthy thing to be doing. No, indeed not. Now, you've talked a bit about um, there being a, a set of pronatal gene or sequence of genes or whatever, um, which never used to be an issue yeah. because basically before birth control didn't matter you're going to have kids kind of whether you wanted to or not if you unless, felt randy you're yeah unless you want to go full monk mode um but now it means it actually means something because now it's a choice do you think that this 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 gene or this sequence of genes is correlated with any sort of political beliefs um I, i've done some research into um, you know, conservatism, uh, you know, kind of what, what it tends to be correlated with and social science is a bit murky. Maybe people try to link it with authoritarianism in a way that's pretty rough, but it seems that the more kind of far to the right you are, the more kids you typically have. It also seems that people with a high disgust instinct tend to have a lot of kids. Um, and that people who have despite the nappy chain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> weirdly. Um, but I think it's because they it kind of insulates them from uh, an environment that they're uncomfortable with. They could just root themselves in their family. Do you, do you know of any other kind of corollaries like this that's associated with high fertility? Well, I think, first of all, the view, the, the, the evidence on genetics is quite limited at this stage, so I wouldn't want to overclaim for that. There mm. is some slightly weak evidence that there is a genetic tendency to be more or less prenatal. And the mm. argument, exactly as you've said, is mm. that it, historically um, mm. expressing that gene is either an advantage or a disadvantage. And even in quite recent times, in the 60s and 70s, there was so much social pressure, it was so much a norm mm. to have children. Now we're in an age when you do or you don't, and that's a lot to do with your values and your lifestyle and whether you find the right partner and what you want out of life. Then it would be expressed, and then you would have children born predominantly to people with that gene. So you could see there's a low fertility period as a kind of hourglass time when a lot of people's genes die out, a lot of lineages die out. Those who are genetically pronatal have larger families, pass those genes on, and humanity then revives itself. It's sort of self -correct. Now, yeah. I don't know if that's the case. I don't know whether it is really going to, whether that gene is strong enough. Mm. Um, but it's an interesting idea. Uh, I would suggest rather that we should rely on cultural norms. We know there are cultural norms that encourage high fertility. We know that. Yes. Uh, the genetics is, is a little uh, a riskier. Now, I know people like um, Malcolm Collins believe mm. that we're going to end up in a world where not only do we all have this high fertility gene, but it correlates very strongly with being tribalist yeah. um, and, and that we'll end up with lots of little warring groups effectively with high fertility. Because I don't know if that's the case. Um, but I think it, it is true that certain cultures are prenatal. And I think the problem for liberalism is that it sits fine as a superstructure on a liberal society, a small or less secular society, where there are small groups of far right nationalists and, and 
extreme uh, Orthodox Jews and 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 uh, uh, you know very devout Muslims and but while those are quite small groups, liberal society can sit ab above it and be very liberal and very nice and keep order mm. and keep order is very important. The fact that it can keep order, mm. but at some point it gets harder and harder. And I think when we look at these hundreds of thousands in the streets, mm. effectively supporting Hamas. Mm. Um, and the problem the police have to keep order, and we project that forward, it's very frightening. Mm. So and it, it could lead to a liberal breakdown because of fundamentally demographic factors, whether, cult whether culturally driven or genetically if driven. I, mm. if, I may, if I may just say so, I mean, uh, and apart from anything else, even though the genetics is very interesting and the more we learn about that, the better. It's always good to know those sorts of things, At least, it's, unless we're going to em embrace, I don't know, some kind of gene editing craze or anything like that, or some federal eugenics. Um, the, culture is the one thing that we can, to some extent, shift and engineer and change. Uh, what do you think we should be doing on that front, particularly at the level of public policy? I mean, it's very, it's very demoralizing to me that there are so few conservative politicians who talk about this. The one exception is Miriam Kate, yeah, who, who, who I think you got met, you, you last, met recently, uh, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, in the last mm. week or two. But what can we do? Is, is Miriam onto something with her, some of her suggestions, do you think? And um, and, and, what, um, and if not, what, what should we be doing? Well, first of all, Miriam is a biology teacher. So one thing she talked about when I met her yesterday, which I think is a great idea, is, is explain in the GCSE course how fertility falls off. So fewer people, particularly fewer women, go through their 30s thinking time is on their side. Yeah, so actually understanding the... And a, a friend of mine who, who chairs the... Um, Human fertil fertility and embryology uh, entity in Britain, which which regulates the uh, use of IVF, and yeah. um, uh, she has the same view that women don't understand the drop off in their fertility. Yeah, it's very rates. cruel that that's not discussed more openly. So if we understood it, you know, when I was a kid, when I was about twelve or thirteen, I learned about Thomas Malthus, and it stuck in my head. When you were twelve and, and thirteen, yeah, you learned about Thomas geography, Malthus. Yeah, really? in geography, and and about the demographic transition, and it stuck in my head, and it just fructified there for years and, and years and there. years. It's still there before I became a demographer. But I think what you learn at the right age can have a big impact. Mm. And if people don't want children, I mean, the, the fact is they do, and they want more than they have, but they don't want, mm. good luck. That's their decision. At a social level, it has consequences they ought to understand. Mm. But at an individual level, if they understood the extent to which their fertility dropped off, and they modeled their lives and their heads 10 years forward, 20 years forward, accordingly. I think it would make a real difference. But in my next book, which is Procreate or Perish, the penultimate chapter is what can government do for us? Oh. And the final chapter is what can we do for ourselves? So I do think that there are policies that can help. The problem is a lot of people will say, I can't afford the housing, I can't afford the childcare, and I'm all in favor of government encouraging those things, subsidizing those things, but we know where childcare is cheap, like in Germany, where housing is cheap, like in parts of Scotland and elsewhere in Europe, fertility rates are still very low. Mm. So I don't think we can just rely on government policy. One thing government can do, though, is shift the culture or help shift the culture. Things like the um, teaching of how biology actually works and the timing mm. on your personal life are very important and we have to accept people are very resistant to this mm. there was a, a head of a cambridge college who wanted to explain it to her undergraduates and she got a very very negative reaction yes. we had a, a, a we had this um event yesterday where a labor mp was invited and she was event effectively scared off this was in westminster this was in westminster yeah. just talking about whether we needed more children and what how we could achieve it. Is, is the event you're talking about at Cambridge as well, because I, I, I know some of the people who are involved in that, I won't name them because they might want, not want to be named, but was it that they were, we were going to put on a film? No, there was the showing of the Stephen Shaw film. That yeah. was one thing. That they, I think it was the head of Murray Edwards College. Uh, I could I have, the, have the wrong one, um, who wanted to talk to her, uh, particularly her female students mm. in their early 20s, about the fertility trajectory. Mm -hmm. And there was a very heavy pushback. Now, whether it happens in their 20s at university or, or in the part of the GCSE sure. curriculum, whenever it is, I think if people actually understood that better, that alone would do, could have would do a thing. significant impact yes. on what people do. Now, one of the things that I've been thinking about recently since I heard a very interesting talk um, on artificial wombs is that like, you're right that um, you can do things in politics which kind of shift you towards a more pro-natal country, more pro-natal outlook. I think that's very good. I think that should be done. But if you look at countries like Hungary, which went from like 1.1 TFR to like 
it's almost at like 1.6 now, mm. that's still not 2.1. No. They've got another 0.5 to go. Or if you look at countries like um, the one that I bring up on every other episode here, uh, Singapore, which has you know like an essentially a benevolent totalitarian state, a multi-ethnic state, um, they the founder of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, was very much a you know you might call him a demographic realist, but I, I would just say that he was very in tune with long-term thinking about the constitution of the country that he was governing, and he did the, things the, the ethnic constitution, the ethnic constitution, but also also age-wise, hmm. um, in a very important way. Like he he would make the the men of Singapore enter university two to three years older than the the women of Singapore because they'd be more likely to pair bond off and have kids, and he really promoted this. Singapore's total fertility right now is like 1.1. It's mm. very, very low, and they haven't really been able to do anything about it despite trying for like five decades. So while I think that politics is downstream of culture, I think they're both downstream of, of tech. And I wonder if we'll end up being forced in a kind of Japanese-like scenario where people will enact policies, they'll, they'll, they'll try to do these things, but the reality is, is that we're going to end up with kind of like gene-spliced fat babies, essentially, because if I was, I, I think, you know, artificial wombs, let's say even if they're 10, 20 years out, that's probably a quicker change than changing the entire trajectory of the natalist movement in England, let's say. And if I was, you know, let's say Victor Orban trying to get up to 2.1, I would just say, well, we're just going to build a couple warehouses and stick a bunch of fat babies in there. Uh, we'll do like kind of Malcolm and Simone gene, gene yeah. selection, not gene editing, but yeah. selection. Um, and my problem has just been solved. I mean, you can literally just invent your way out of it. And they are doing, they do have artificial wombs now for lambs. You know, I mean, growing a human is not that much harder than growing a lamb. I mean, you think about 10 years from now, I kind of feel like it'll happen. I kind of feel like a lot of countries that don't want to die out, maybe South Korea would be the, a great example, or Japan, will just end up adopting this technology en masse and saying, look, we, if we can, can't convince you guys to have kids, so we'll just grow our own. Do you think this is kind of a realistic scenario, or have I just been watching way too many sci-fi movies? You've definitely been watching way too many sci-fi, <laughs> but regardless, I mean, just one thing on Singapore, it's interesting. I've got a friend who uh, was at university with me, and when she went back to Singapore, she was sent on love cruises to yep. meet uh, suitable young men. And at that point, what was happening in Singapore was what I call the eugenics moment. And it was the same in Britain in Edwardian England. Yes. Uh, what happens is low fertility starts at the top of society mm. and people then panic. The wrong sort of people are having children. The right sort of people aren't having children. And that's where eugenics and, and Lee Kuan Yew was. Just a, quick, just a quick, yeah. very, very quick interjection. Yeah. As well. It's very interesting about Britain as well. This doesn't quite gel with modern sentiments about politics, but the people who were disproportionately in favour of eugenics in that Edwardian area were people, well, of, the the, people of the left. People oh, yes, like it was, it was the Beatrice Fabians, Webb and the Fabians yeah, and people Wells. like Keynes and yeah. people like Wells. <coughs> so, yeah. and, and Keynes actually is very interested in, yeah. in demography. So you have this eugenics moment and then um, be careful what you wish for. The, mm. the lower orders start having smaller families too. Mm. And that's what happened. So, I mean, that's an interesting thing. Other thing about Singapore, of course, is it is a very small island and both from an ethnic and a general population point of view it can turn on the tap when it likes a lot of chinese people want to go to singapore you, a lot of chinese people like to get their money out and a lot of people who were who were using hong kong for that purpose would rather be down in singapore and have their money their fortune and their their freedom mm. more not that it's a super free society but compared to china so um singapore's in a very special situation in that respect and it can it can attract many Chinese from Malaysia and so on, sure. if it wants to. But again, that's import, that's not yeah, title. Yeah, no, no, I appreciate that. But I think that where you're so small and you have such a large reservoir of ethnically compliant or conforming uh, potential migrants, Co -co -ethnic that migrants. does make a difference. Although, you know, I, and from my Singaporean friends, they don't particularly want loads of Chinese immigrants, for a whole set of reasons, but <laughs> nevertheless. Um, <coughs> so... The, 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 the technology of the womb and, and, and all this, I don't really know. I can't really answer. I haven't been watching enough sci-fi films, probably. But it does make me think, when I was preparing to write this, this next book, I was about to write the chapter on the religious, Shall the Religious Inherit the Earth, mm. to use Eric Kaplan's yeah, famous book. title. And it is a great book. Um, and I received, the week before, I received an email saying, Dear Paul mm. Morland, I'm a traditional Catholic, you don't talk enough about traditional Catholics, my brother's got 10, my sister's got 12, blah, blah, blah. Are you the Paul Morland I used to know 30, 
40 years ago actually so it was someone I hadn't seen for 40 years just as I'm about to write this chapter she gets in touch and so I go to see her and we have a very interesting chat and I said to her something about the Collinses Mm. both about their views on the technology of reproduction which they have to use but they've got views about how it will change and also their views about the need to invent a new religion and her response to me was I'm very happy they're pronatalists but they seem to want to in reinvent what God has given us mm. perfectly adequately so I find the idea of, of, of uh, womb farms rather horrendous I don't know who's going to bring these children up exactly. and in what ideology we have the solution and the solution is um, we are okay people talk about falling falling uh, sperm counts and at the moment the evidence suggests that relatively few people at an appropriate age have trouble getting of course people do mm -hmm. but with reasonably regular sexual congress at, at, at an appropriate age most people will get pregnant fairly soon plenty of sympathy for those who mm. don't what can we do to help them all that sympathy but the demographic issue is not driven by biology at this stage other than people trying very late so if we have the the tools and techniques in our nature why are we so keen to create these weird sci-fi uh, futures whether it's about the, the Collins's religion uh, invention of religion which I think is very innovative and very interesting uh, but there seem to be plenty of other religions out there to choose mm. from already or whether it's the technology to be fertile when most of us are perfectly fertile as we are let me just ask you a very quick question before we wrap up it's been very interesting uh, the, we we like to think that we have a fairly young cohort of people in the audience why should they have children why is it a good idea for people to, for young people to have children how would you how would you tell them to do that i think there are three reasons to have children they are the practical and the philosophical and the personal so the practical is all the stuff we've been talking about mm -hmm. um, which expresses itself at a social level labor shortage and so on when people may not be moved mm -hmm. by that but exactly the point you were making uh, you know my mother's 90 and my sister and I take her to doctor's appointment she's very independent she's very uh, alert but having two kids helping out and seven grandchildren visiting helping out bringing food picking this or that up it makes a big difference so what we talked about at the social level is true but if you've got your own kids particularly in a world where we're going to have too few people having your own kids is going to be even yes, more that so that's the practical the personal is that if you actually the philosophical and then okay the, person, the then philosophical the is the debate about why we should have children the religious and philosophical debate the religious traditions mm -hmm. the debate with the antinatalists uh this this south african antinatalist david bennett i think is his oh, name. there is a whole movement of mm. antinatalism with with which i'm very happy to engage mm. they have their view i have mine um ultimately i think for, from personally from a philosophical re point of view pretty grotesque I, I i i go back to the sort of religious fundamentals of the judeo-christian tradition be fruitful and multiply we're told several times in the bible so um, whether that's philosophical or religious it's I ideal mm. rather than material if you like yes. um but i appreciate that on on that score as on the first score there are pros and cons but i think on balance um, the, cons, uh, the, the pros went the out. The pros went out and then philosophically, the and, and, the and, and the 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 personal is that if you actually ask people how many children they want, they want more than they're having. So that's an issue for government. That's something that Miriam Cates talks about mm. a lot, and I think it's really important. Yes. And thank goodness for that. It would be very worrying if people, on average, wanted one child. Mm. So you know that's something we've got in hand to work with. And the other point is, if you ask them after the event, did you have more? Would you wish you'd had more children or fewer children? Far more say they wish they had had more hmm. than say they wish they had had fewer. So the final thing I would say is, and I, I think I made this point on a broadcast I did the other day. For me, just going back to the totally personal, having children was the greatest adventure I ever set out on it's been the most exciting and fulfilling and wonderful thing and even more wonderful is you get a sort of second second dividend when you have grandchildren mm. i've had two grandchildren this year and i can't tell you how wonderful it is so be bold weigh in uh put aside your fears and concerns uh just get on with it and then figure it out afterwards and i think the chance of regretting it is very small as one of sorry the, i was going to say the chance mm. of regretting it if you don't is much greater yeah, wonderful, cl wonderful clarion call to broodiness and we waxing and multiplying. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Paul Mullen, for coming on to Deprogrammed. Thank Evan, you, thanks as ever. Of course. You've been watching Deprogrammed. Make sure to like, subscribe, leave a comment if you wish, and we shall see you on the next one. Hello. 
If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.